The wanton moan she still calling out obscenities, full of coerced rapture until only his name was on her lips. Oh, Shepard. The grew. His as it could go, the instant her muscles began clenching rhythmically to draw out Watching him grunt like a beast, Claire felt the lost in the rapture of her greedy milking his until with the stuff. While the persisted, Shepard looked into disoriented green eyes and demanded roughly, Whose name did you call as you Claire could hardly breathe, was on the ebb of a powerful that shook her to her bones. She whispered, trying not to cry, Yours. Because I am your alpha. It was almost a roar. You want to be fucked by me. Do you understand? Shaking I'm the only man you will ever f from this moment on. Draco roared. I will not share you. Ever! You will never have an opportunity to f anyone else! His hand tightened around her neck as he leaned in, growling. No other man alive should have had what I own! You will tell me who they are and where they are, and then you will declare me your alpha! Watching her lips form words, dissecting the tortured desire and uncontrolled pleasure, he even faster, snarling like a beast, still with He demanded, Who do you belong to? There were tears leaking from the eyes, squeezed shut as she jerked and twitched from his abuse and prolonged too far. Please, please stop. I can't. Who do you belong to? Face full of pain, pleasure, Claire gasped. I belong to you. That's right, little one. Came a voice as if leagues away. The baited and she sobbed when the overstrong extended began to abate. More waves of burned her from the inside when Shepard purred, You belong only to me. Hey everyone, get set to get wet because so a few months ago, there was this article in the New York Times with the title, A Feud in Wolf Kink Erotica Raises a Deep Legal Question, Subheader, What Do Copyright and Authorship Mean in the Crowdsourced Realm Known as the Omegaverse? And I gotta tell you, this article doesn't even come close to scratching the surface of how coconuts this whole thing is. So where to start? Okay, so there was this lawsuit surrounding some works of fiction that incorporated the fanfic trope known as 
ABO or Omegaverse and one thing led to another and before you know it, the New York Times gets to explain concepts like estrus cycles, claiming bites, forced impregnation, nodding, which is, um, well, it's like, uh, <laughs> apparently it's a uh, feature of wolf anatomy. It's got everything. Sock puppetry, falsified documents, violent heat cycle, perjury, spurts of, well, oh no! It's like the Tiger King of wolf porn. And the deep legal question is, in effect, who owns ideas? Where do you draw the line between what is and is not worthy of copyright? And why does it involve so much bodily fluid? You're like the loudest climaxer I've ever heard. It was like the sound of like a 30 year old sprinkler finally going off for the first time. So what is the Omegaverse? So I'm just going to call this a subgenre of erotica because if you ignore the fanfic specificity, that's all it is. The concept of Omegaverse originally started as a subgenre of erotic speculative fanfiction in the supernatural fandom and found broader appeal in the sprawling mega fandom known as Super Hulock, an amalgam of Supernatural, Sherlock, and Doctor Who in the early 2010s. These stories are characterized by alternate human societies, which are divided into a dominance hierarchy like wolves, but not like real wolves, more like that study that divided wolves into alphas and betas that was later debunked by the guy who did the original study. So it's based on like bad wolf science. These societies contain alphas, the dominating alphas, the big boys, the dick swingers, the betas. Despite its current common use as a pejorative for a submissive man, betas in ABO are neutral. They're like the normies. Like sure, they will do the do, but they don't go into like uncontrollable pheromone rages at the smell of an Omega's heat cycle. Speaking of which, Omegas, the submissive, the soft boys, the seducees who find themselves drawn to the shitlording of alphas because they're pheromones or whatever. The subgenre also includes other esoterica and tropes of wolf behavior, like mating for life, rutting, heat cycles, nodding, <sighs> sense marking, claiming bites, and impreg, which, if the portmanteau doesn't tell you enough, is the ability for male characters, usually omegas, to get pregnant. I don't think wolves can do that, but it is an important staple of the genre. Any fictional property can be omegaversed. Lord of the Rings, Supernatural, One Direction, Game of Thrones, Transformers, hell, there's even Hamilton Omegaverse fan fiction and fan art. Like, a lot. So I stopped being actively involved in creating and consuming fan works around the time that I started making internet videos back in the 1960s. So I kind of phased out before this trend became popular. So while I had heard of it, my first real exposure to the whole Omegaverse thing was the New York Times article. He knew for certain now that he did not want a submissive Omega. When Kaylin had threatened him, her voice low and possessive, her eyes flashing, her body ready to pounce, he almost came in his pants. Wow. Open my window when a breeze rolls in and I Shizz in my pants When Bruce Willis was dead at the end of Sixth Sense I Shizzed in my pants So this brave new world is all very strange and confusing to me. I'm like Grandpa Simpson over here. I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. But at the end of the day, it's just fanfic. Where could a lawsuit possibly come into this? Well, since this trope is so popular, it was only a matter of time before people decided, hey, I could make money off of this. <laughs> Commercial publication of Omegaverse fiction is said by some to have started with 2007's With Caution by J.L. Langley, but like the overwhelming majority of Omegaverse fanfiction, it centered male-male relationships. The commonality of male-male pairings is the crux of the most batshit copyright claim ever. Enter Addison Kane. Now this is not her real name, but I'm going to just refer to her by her pen name because. So Addison Kane, of course, like so many of us, begins her career as a fanfic writer. She finds her fanfic calling writing erotic The Dark Knight Rises fanfiction starting in 2012 and quickly becomes something of a darling in the fandom. And like E.L. James before her, she starts to think, hey, maybe there's money to be made here. 
So she pulls her fanfic and begins the process of revising it into something that she can sell. And while we are here, one of the many negative side effects of the infamous popularity of books like Fifty Shades of Grey is this presumption that any professional author who so much as admits to having been in fandom is just repurposing their old fanfic. And if they say they aren't, they are probably lying about it. I've seen a lot of people make that assumption about me just because I've joked about having written fanfic in the past. Most fanfic authors who jump to professional authorship do not just repurpose their old fanfic. Naomi Novik, for instance, got her start in the Master and Commander fandom in the early 2000s, so that influence was there when she published the Temeraire series, which is basically the Napoleonic Wars but with dragons. And a lot of people who have read my book can tell that I have spent some time in the Transformers fandom. But these are not just works of fan fiction repackaged for profit. However, there are some high profile examples of authors doing just that, a practice called filing the serial numbers off. Some authors have found tremendous success with taking their fanfic and turning it into original fiction. Fifty Shades of Grey was originally a Twilight fanfic, Cassandra Clare's Mortal Instruments series began life as a Draco fanfic, After was a Wattpad One Direction fanfic about a bad boy version of Harry Styles in college, and this is the business model that Addison Kane, erotic Dark Knight Rises fanfic writer, hopes to hit pay dirt with. Now most publishers reject or ignore her queries, but eventually small indie publisher, Blushing Books, accepts her manuscript for what would become the first book in a series, Born to be Bound, and the series soon earns over $370,000. When she grew tamer as the overblown reaction to force estrus lessened, she would stay still long enough for him to send her. For his big hands to rub the <laughs> that had <laughs> all over her skin, to it to her as he purred and gave affection. Damn. <laughs> so Kane becomes something of a star in the budding commercial Omegaverse published arena, especially, according to Kane, in the MF field, what in the fanfic world is called het, because fanfiction is one of the rare arenas where heterosexual couplings are actually in the minority. But of course, since this genre turns out to be lucrative, she's not the only one doing it. Enter author Zoe Ellis. No relation, because it's not her real name either. Zoe Ellis is the nom de plume of eh? writing for Quill Inks Books, which is a small publisher based in London. Her novel, Crave to Conquer, the first book in the Myth of Omega series, is published in 2018. Like Born to be Bound, it is also Omegaverse, also het, and also extremely violent and unpleasant to read, and I don't recommend it. I don't know what I expected. So not long after, someone approaches Kane and says, Hey, this book seems to lift a lot of plot points from your book. I think it might be plagiarism. And of course, Kane does not take this well. Well, Kane's publisher does not take this well. She does not see this as a rising tide lifts all ship scenario, which generally in genres like this it totally is. Oh no, she sees a rival horning in on her territory. Scenting it, you might say. Anyway. Zoe Ellis must be destroyed. In April of 2018, Kane's publisher, Blushing Books, sends DMCA takedown notices to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, Kobo, and iTunes. Blushing claims that Crave to Conquer did a copyright infringement by lifting multiple plot points from Born to be Bound, and that while Kane did not invent Omegaverse, she did invent Het Omegaverse, which... Hmm. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. Anyway, DMCA takedown notices. We hear a lot about them, but few know how they actually work or what they are supposed to do. Maybe we could get a lawyer to explain it. Real phone call happening. Hello? Hey, Lindsay, what's up? Hey, Devin of Legal Eagle. Have you heard about this Omegaverse uh, lawsuit that are happening? Yeah, I know a fair amount about copyright law, but I don't know anything about wolf pornography. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, 
Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, uh, was a law that was written in the very early days of the internet to decide who would be liable for hosting copyright infringing material. It would be easy to imagine a world where a website was responsible for the content that its users uploaded. You can imagine that if a user uploaded some copyright infringing material, uh, that the rights holders could go after the platform for damages. And in that world, it would be way easier to get damages from the website or platform instead of the random user who uploaded it. The problem is that if that were the case, then no one would host a website that allowed users to upload material because they would always be at the mercy of all of these copyright suits. So Congress decided in their infinite wisdom in the mid 90s that it made sense to give a way for platforms to have immunity from these copyright infringement lawsuits. Section 512 of the DMCA actually gives platforms a safe harbor so that they're not responsible for the content that their users upload if it's infringing of copyright. But in able to receive that safe harbor, they actually have to do certain requirements. The main requirement is that if a website or platform receives a notice, a DMCA notice, that some content that they're hosting infringes of someone's copyright, then they have to take that down. That's called a DMCA notice. On the other hand, a, a user who believes that this DMCA takedown notice was given in error can issue what's called a DMCA counter notice and uh, get the content put back up. So generally speaking, when a platform like YouTube, let's say, receives a proper DMCA takedown notice notifying them that some material infringes on someone's copyright and they take that material down, then the DMCA gives them a safe harbor and prevents YouTube specifically from being sued for copyright infringement. Now, in exchange, copyright holders no longer have to go to court to get things taken down. They just need to send a form. So in a way, it can avoid a whole bunch of litigation costs when some user uploads some content that's not theirs to upload in the first place. So a DMCA takedown notice is a party claiming that a platform is hosting some content that's illegally infringing on copyright. And you can see how powerful this tool could be in the wrong hands, that you can take down almost any website or video that's on the internet so long as you make a DMCA claim, which is why the DMCA requires you to have a good faith basis that there's copyright infringement going on, that you have to swear under the penalty of perjury that you actually own the underlying content that was infringed uh, and that there was actually copyright infringement going on. Because if you're going to be making a claiming bite, you had better be ready to pair bond for life. Uh, I have no idea what that means, but Lindsay says it makes sense in context. So there you go, I guess. But when we're talking about the DMCA, if you're a platform, you can get in trouble for refusing to take down different material. If you refuse a DMCA takedown notice, then and only then can the underlying rights holder sue the platform. So if YouTube gets a DMCA claim and they say, no, we're gonna leave this video up, then they can be sued for copyright infringement. But if they take the video down, then they're not liable to anyone, which is why you see a lot of platforms, whether it's Twitter or Amazon or YouTube, they just get the DMCA takedown notices and take those videos down because it's no skin off their nose and they don't have to do an independent analysis to determine whether the video or other IP actually does the infringing. That's up to the person that made the claim. And if the person made a claim that isn't valid, then they can be liable in court for that invalid DMCA takedown. So that's why you get a lot of platforms that are removing content without doing an independent analysis because there's no reason for them to do any kind of independent analysis. So this is a really complicated area of the law, but that is DMCA liability in a nutshell. I cannot believe I just talked about wolf c for f five. So Blushing Books issues DMCA claims across all platforms, and all of Zoe Ellis's books get taken down. Even people who bought the book on e-readers, like Kindle, the book magically disappears from their devices. So here is a big problem with the whole DRM thing, but we aren't getting into that today. On April 19th, 2018, Kane wrote this Facebook post for her fans. My publishing house has chosen to take legal action against another author for plagiarism and copyright infringement of one of my books. They own the rights to print and distribute my story, and should an outside influence try to profit from it, they are legally bound to respond. This is outside of my control. 
please consider that this is very serious. A publishing house does not make a move like this without solid evidence and the full knowledge that any legal battle is already won. I am sick to my stomach thinking about it. I wish this had never happened. I apologize to every single one of you who were affected by this mess. I apologize to anyone who has been upset by this. And lastly, I apologize to my fans and the fans of Omegaverse. No one is winning here. For the torches and pitchforks that will inevitably come my way, please remember that I'm just a regular person stuck in the middle of this mess too. I never asked for this, and I'm heartbroken. So let's compare the two books. Was Crave to Conquer plagiarizing Born to be Bound? Born to be Bound. The world has been decimated by some plague or something, and now everybody lives in cities under domes. The alpha love interest is head of a terrorist organization that has taken over the city with biochemical weapons and is a massive, chonky big boy. You think you know what prison is, little one. You do not. In prison, one is surrounded by the worst possible breed of men. If I wanted food or water, I had to kill for it. He's a bit of a political zealot, and also he and all of his minions escaped from a prison pit. That term you use for it, the Undercroft, I find it amusing. A poetic word used to describe a place of darkness, filled with the pleas of thousands, scraping at the doors to get out. And also he lives in the prison pit, and he was, he was born in the darkness. <laughs> molded by it. Okay, it's Bane. It's Bane. It's, it's obviously Bane. We get it. It's Bane. And for crimes, crime is irrelevant. I was never condemned to your Undercroft. I was born there. Enter Claire, an Omega posing as a Beta with the help of hormone pills, who comes to Bane, I mean Shepard, to beg him for help for her Omega posse. Will Bane discover her secret? Yes, immediately. Crave to Conquer, Myth of Omega, Book 1. A large and powerful army has conquered a kingdom. Their hormone-laden leader, Khal Drogo, Draco, has promised his followers Omega mates, even though Omegas have mysteriously disappeared from society. Enter Kaelin, an Omega spy posing as a beta with the help of magic, who pretends to be a researcher in order to get into Draco's library. Will Draco discover her secret? Yes, immediately. Plot similarities include, but are not limited to, a dearth of Omegas. Alphas take them hostage. Omegas are in hiding and trying to suppress hormones through pills or magic, but they fail. The Omega is captured by the Alpha when her magic or pills fail in public and she goes into heat, nodding, dubious consent slash non-consent. Both of the first books end with the heroine escaping their Alpha, the list goes on from there. But does Kane actually have a basis to make the claim that Crave to Conquer was infringing on Born to be Bound's copyright? Well, here's a Facebook exchange from August of 2018. So I've read almost all the MF Omegaverse on Amazon, and I read a lot of MM Omegaverse. There are some differences that I've noticed other than the obvious, but one of them is that the MF pairings tend to be rough and almost brutal sometimes even when the Alpha and Omega are in a relationship or have feelings for each other. The MM stories tend to be a lot sweeter, and there isn't the same kind of violence, for lack of a better word, in their matings. I think the reason the male-female pairings are more violent is because I was the first to write them, and I'm a non-con, dub-con writer. What followed suit was keeping in line with the trend. LOL. Addison corrupts everyone! Stunning. How did you get into writing Omegaverse books, especially MF Omegaverse? I'm not going to lie, yours were the first ones that I found that were not MM. I was the first for male-female. I loved reading Omegaverse fanfiction, but got so frustrated that it never included women. So I made my own meta, Rules of the Universe, for male-female Omegaverse and wrote my own. So Kane claims that she innovated invading queer spaces and making them all normie and het. And also, she innovated non-con. Sure, Jan. <laughs> this is also uh, not true. The first mainstream heterosexual Omegaverse novel that was published by a major publisher was called Alpha and Omega by Patricia Briggs beginning in 2008. And the idea that Kane innovated bringing non-con into this fuckery is just... Okay. <laughs> 
Sure, Jan. This is not the first time that Kane has gone after the competition either. In March of 2016, she wrote a Facebook post charging that another author, who wrote under the pen name The Dragon's Maiden, had copied at least, again, 15 plot points from Born to be Bred. Just so you don't believe her hype, I have tried to be lighthearted about this, but it has been a nightmare. I finally posted a response to the plagiarism of BTBB by the Dragon's Maiden in her story To Mate an Omega. This was my post, which was taken down within 30 minutes. After the post will be her response. Do I believe she plagiarized my story? Yes. Do I expect everyone to agree with me? No. The DMCA will be the final judge of the matter. I just had to say my piece, and I know you can respect that. Her response was to shut down all comments and write this. This isn't meant to sound snide, so please don't take it that way, but I am not going to stop writing because I know 100% that I am not copying you. But to the main reason I am messaging you. If I keep getting rude and threatening messages from your readers, I will start reporting them. I woke up to several this morning. I sincerely hope you aren't encouraging that kind of behavior, but if I find out you are, I will feel it necessary to report you as well. If you would like to discuss this farther, please feel free to email me at email removed to protect her privacy. Dragon's Maiden denied she had stolen anything and alleged that her fans came after me even though our stories, other than being Omegaverse, were nothing alike. There are some similarities, but I honestly believe that they don't go beyond common lichen traits or actual wolf behavior. Mm, you know, let's just ignore the part about wolf behavior. Dragon's Maiden quickly caved, deciding it just wasn't worth fighting against Kane and her fans, and pulled her stories. Sorry. Due to the number of comments that are either borderline threatening, you're going to regret slash be sorry, etc., or outright threatening, a threat to trace my IP and make me stop writing, it was recommended to me that I remove my work. As it stands right now, I have filed a police report due to the harassment. People like this believe their own lies. Her story is being taken down for plagiarism, plain and simple. I have one last point I want to make. I have not ever stirred up my fans against another writer. So Kane had gone after other authors before crying copyright infringement, but not with so much DMCA zealotry as she did with Zoe Ellis. While DMCA allows for users to upload stuff without opening up platforms for liability, it is a touch, to put it mildly, flawed and is a system, according to legal experts, that is easily abused. For instance, authors might weaponize the DMCA to take down their rivals, and megalopolies like Amazon aren't going to take the time to make sure the DMCA claims are legit. After all, by nature of the law, the legal liability is on the person making the claim, not the platform hosting the content. If DMCA claims aren't legit, it can take months to undo them, months of lost income. And there's no real incentive for platforms like Amazon to be quick about checking those things out. In a lot of cases, the only thing you can do is... Sue. <laughs> So Zoe Ellis sues Addison Kane in Oklahoma Federal Court, where Ellis's American Digital Distributor is based, in October of 2018. The same month, Ellis wrote the following on her website in a post titled, No one owns a genre, least of all Omegaverse. Instead of responding to attempts to resolve this issue amicably, the publisher and author chose to delay communication and persisted with threats of blackmail and attempted intimidation, as well as continued existing attacks against my character and books in collusion with others. I've since learned of other MF Omegaverse readers who were similarly targeted by the same parties, including one who abandoned her story due to threats and takedown attempts. My publisher, after seeking professional guidance, realized legal action was unavoidable. Obviously, as a new author, this was a scary conclusion for me, but the various actions taken by the author and publisher have been astonishingly wide-ranging and consistent, and can ultimately prevent me from having a successful career. I wrote my own interpretation of the Omegaverse, creating my own character's world and stories, and I have the right to publish and promote my work without unprovoked interference and defamation from others, regardless of their popularity. Anyone who reads both works without bias can clearly see they are not the same story, even if they are unfamiliar with the genre. So my publisher has now filed a lawsuit to address these unwarranted attacks on my works and reputation. So Ellis sues Kane as an individual, as well as the digital distributor, and the publisher Blushing Books, and the anonymous posters that went after Ellis, uh, who she seems to assume are sock puppets operated by Addison Kane and or her publisher. In addition to suing her for the wrongful DMCA takedowns, she sues for a whole bunch of other stuff, like malicious interference of contract, copyright misuse, misrepresenting claims under the DMCA, and a bunch of other torts, negligence, defamation, the list goes on and on. 
The lawsuit effectively begins with outlining what Omegaverse is in a context of genre. Omegaverse, or Alpha Beta Omega, ABO, or Alpha Beta Omega Dynamics, as its slightly broader category is called, is a collection of related tropes that tend to correlate in many stories. ABO defines stories in which humans are not only categorized by gender, but also by a second dynamic. To be recognized as an Omegaverse, at least some of a vast number of potential characteristics need to be present. These include imprinting, the mythology with scenting, Omega. pheromones are excessive, Omega heat cycles and alpha rut, mate the bonding, a permanent bond between the partners, nodding, a physiological condition experienced by the alpha during mating to aid in pregnancy, male and female. A lawyer actually wrote this and uh... Multiple federal judges had to read it. <laughs> Woo. The lawsuit also puts front and center the fact that authors abusing copyright law in the romance genre is also nothing new. The literary world, especially within the romance genre and its subgenres, has experienced anti-competitive behavior by certain bad actors attempting to monopolize the industry through misuse of trademark and copyright law, ranging from misuse of takedown notices to litigation over the use of a common word in a book title. Unlawful practices are becoming more and more prevalent. So let's take a moment to discuss Cockygate. After the novel Cocky Bastard by Penelope Ward and Vi Keeland, published by Ever After Romance, became a big hit in 2015, the genre became flooded with titles involving the word cocky. One author, Felina Hopkins, took this a step further to make sure that her novels, Cocker Brothers, the cocky series, would stay above the dick pun laden swill by submitting two trademark claims to the US Patent and Trademark Office. One, trademarking the usage of the word cocky in certain fonts, and two, officially having full stop control of the word in all romance novel titles. Naturally, people disputed this. It became a huge controversy and a legal battle is still ongoing, but Hopkins did end up releasing her claims, which means you can expect the sequel to Axiom's End, The Cocky Bugman from Planet Cockbobble, to hit shelves in fall of 2021. I don't know if you can tell, but I did not write that line. So Kane hits back in a blog post on her personal website. My fight is also yours. We cannot allow one bad player to change the rules of the game. We must stand as a community and refute the idea that one author can bully and manipulate another author over DMCA sent by their publisher. It sets a dangerous precedent for the next author who is just trying to protect their work and their livelihoods. Just think about all those DMCA's authors are sending to stop Travis McRae's pirate website. Can you imagine if he chose to drag you into court over just one of them? Unfortunately, I can. I will no longer keep silent. It is now time to hashtag get loud. Kane also started a GoFundMe for her legal fees, which starts with the bolded header Authors should not be sued or harassed for their publisher rightfully filing DMCAs. Rightfully. Hmm. Interesting. This lawsuit is a 512F case, which is actually very rare. Notice and takedown is the section 512 of the DMCA. 512F is what allows people to sue other people for bogus takedowns. But it's very rare because, well, it's expensive to sue, and victims of DMCA abuse usually get mired in the internal bullshit of the platforms they're using before it gets to the lawsuit point. Part of the DMCA is you are supposed to consider fair use before you issue a DMCA takedown. Moreover, someone who is a victim of a false DMCA takedown probably isn't going to be under the umbrella of a major corporation with a lot of assets. They're probably going to be a smaller creator, or in this case, a small press without a lot of resources. One of the last high profile 512F cases was YouTube suing someone for sending false DMCA takedowns because YouTube has the resources to actually go to court and could afford it. And even in that case, they ended up settling out of court. So as they were building their case, Ellis's lawyers thought they had a strong position, but according to that New York Times article, they struggled to find a prior case that addressed whether fanfiction tropes could be protected by copyright. Said Gideon Ling Kekum, a lawyer who represents Quill Inc. and Zoe Ellis, We were looking at cases to see if the courts had ever dealt with anything like this before. Dealing with the emergence of this new literary genre, he found there weren't any. But then we get to the deposition, which, like so many elements of this case, seems weirdly fixated on the 
originated in fanfic element. Your book published by Blushing. Okay, the first of the books that we're talking about here. Is that fan fiction? It is not fan fiction. And why is it not fan fiction? To be a fan fiction, it has to exist in a universe that you don't own. When I wrote the story, I hardly used anything from that universe at the time. I just used like a couple little things here. When I rewrote the story, all of that was taken out, characters were modified, scenes were rewritten, so it is definitely not fan fiction. So, uh, let me see if this is a different question. Is that book in the Omegaverse? That book is an Omegaverse book. Are there aspects of the Omegaverse that are manifested in that book that constitute a reality or a universe that you contend you own? I don't own Omegaverse. Is there any part of the first book which creates a reality that you contend you do own? I do not own Omegaverse. I understand. That's not what I'm asking. Okay. As I understood it, and again, I told you there are places where I'm just not going to understand, uh -huh. because I don't know that much about fan fiction, and I don't know that much about the Omegaverse. As I understand it, it's not fan fiction, because it's not in a universe that you don't own. Look, I I'll just try this one more time, and then I'll drop it. And I'll preface that question with this. I I'm having a problem with what I perceive as a logical inconsistency. Okay. Okay. Your books are in the Omegaverse. Yes. We agree on that. Nobody owns the Omegaverse. Exactly. Fan fiction is books that are set in a universe you don't own. Yes. But despite the fact that your books are set in a universe that nobody owns, they're not fan fiction? Exactly. Number on the top. What is the number on the there top? There are no numbers on the top. There's letters. Oh! <laughs> okay, Mr. Lawyer Man, let me help you out. The confusion here seems to be semantic and is probably based in the use of the verse uh, part of the word. I would agree that something set in the Omegaverse is not fan fiction because Omegaverse is the name of a subgenre. The word Omegaverse isn't used in the same way we use phrases like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which if you set a story in that would be considered fan fiction. So I can see where it could be confusing. However, that question is completely immaterial to this case and the DMCA. Whether or not Born to be Bound was or is fanfic has fuck all to do with whether or not there was plagiarism. The fact that Omegaverse originates in fanfic is completely immaterial to the legality of this case. And I don't understand why these lawyers, or the New York Times for that matter, even mentioned that they couldn't find a fanfic related precedent. I'm sure one day the legality of fanfic is going to get litigated and it's going to suck. But what does it have to do with this, a case of DMCA takedowns being abused by an author trying to snuff out the competition? Kane claims that Ellis's book hit a lot of the same plot points as hers did, which is true. But in copyright law, there is a doctrine called sans affaire, that is, you cannot copyright tropes that consumers expect of a genre. Take YA paranormal romance, for example. You can't copyright the concept of like a cute but haunted high school boy who is also secretly a monster of some sort, who becomes obsessed with the clumsy and remarkable female protagonist. It's like diamonds. Pick any two YA paranormal romance novels from the early 2010s, and each one is easily going to share 15 plot points with any other, which if you line them up next to each other with no context, could look pretty damning, when in reality, that's just part and parcel of the genre. In other words, Crave to Conquer is about as similar to Born to be Bound as any of the shit million Twilight knockoffs were to Twilight. Born to be Bound and Crave to Conquer, aside from using Omegaverse tropes, aren't even in the same genre. One is future dystopia, the other is fantasy. So while there's no case law directly about genres that have emerged from the internet, that doesn't really matter. Copyright, fair use, and sans affair included are elastic on purpose to fit changing circumstances. And it must needs be remarked that it is extremely ironic that we have a fan fiction author who published her erotic fiction, which was just Batman fanfic with the serial numbers filed off, filing DMCA claims against an author who just appears to be using Omegaverse tropes rather than just repurposing her old fanfic fiction, I'm sorry, her publisher filed DMCA claims against an author who appears to just be using Omegaverse tropes in original fiction. Addison Kane had nothing to do with those DMCA claims. See, see, that's, uh, that's foreshadowing. So the issue here is that a lot of the tropes that Kane is claiming Ellis infringed upon aren't just common to the by now well-worn Omegaverse, they're also kind of common to books? Omegaverse, and indeed fanfiction as a concept, did not innovate most of these tropes. The I don't like you slash enemies to lover trope is a feature of most romance novels. 
you know, Beast, Beauty, something something, Tale as Old as Time. Like even the OG Pride and Prejudice does the I don't like you to lovers thing. Alpha male dub conning a woman who eventually falls in love with him is also a romance novel staple. From The Sheik in 1919, to Bodice Rivers in the 1970s and 80s, to what we see now, sexual violence turning into true love is nothing new. The whole Alpha Omega thing is just a roided up version of what you get in Bodice Rippers, just with, you know, more fluids and, well... <laughs> For fuck's sake, well before Omegaverse was even a thing, the common parlance term for a domineering male hero in the mainstream romance novel genre was, and continues to be, an alpha. And while the dubcon and noncon elements have fallen out of favor in most mainstream romance novel presses, it's still a big thing in self-published works and small presses like these. So to be clear, Addison Kane, I'm sorry, Addison Kane's publisher is completely in the wrong here. Those DMCA claims were illegal and illegitimate. Kane's publisher is wrong. Even if Ellis totally stole those ideas from Born to be Bound, the ideas she stole were too much part and parcel of the subgenre of Omegaverse to possibly constitute copyright infringement. <laughs> So the only way Oklahoma could have jurisdiction is if Addison Kane personally did stuff to people in the state of Oklahoma, in this case, Zoe Ellis's digital distributor, which is based in Oklahoma. So Kane moves to dismiss herself from the Oklahoma case. She is, after all, a Virginia resident. And Kane is like, no, I didn't do it. The publisher did it. I had nothing to do with those DMCA claims. I've never even been to Oklahoma. No. It wasn't me. It was the one-armed man. So Kane submits an affidavit in an official court document claiming that she had no contacts with Oklahoma and she had nothing to do with those takedown notices. That was all blushing books. She didn't know about it. She didn't have anything to do about it. Yeah, cross my head. In any event, blushing books DMCA notice, without more, is insufficient to satisfy the requirements of jurisdictional due process over m an out-of-state individual. Moreover, even if the DMCA notice was sent to Draft Digital in Oklahoma, that communication would not be attributable to Mrs. Here, Mrs. did not purposefully direct any activities at Oklahoma, including drafting or sending the DMCA takedown notice to Draft Digital or other third parties. Blushing Books sent the DMCA takedown notice to all of the third party publishers and retailers, including Draft 2 Digital. Thus, even if the court finds that it can exercise personal jurisdiction over Blushing Books, which Miss argues that it cannot, it should dismiss all of plaintiff's claims against Mrs because she did not personally direct any acts or activities into the state of Oklahoma. I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct, executed on November 26, 2018. So the motion against Kane in Oklahoma is dismissed, but the case against the publisher, Blushing Books, continues in Oklahoma. Oh, and also there is a second lawsuit in Virginia where Kane lives, we'll get to that. But in the meantime, the charges against Kane are dropped and it's time for discovery in the Oklahoma case. <laughs> Discovery is a pre-trial procedure in a lawsuit in which each party can obtain evidence from the other party by means of discovery devices such as interrogatories, requests for documents, requests for admissions, and so on. So Quill Inc.'s lawyers demand to see all the correspondence between Kane and her publisher during this time and... Oh boy. <laughs> DMCAs have been sent to Amazon, iBooks, Barnes & Nobles, Kobo, and Google Play. When the books come down and the inevitable backlash begins, this is what I intend to post on Facebook about it. If you have any feedback on this, please let me know. Smiley face. My publishing house has chosen to take legal action against another author for plagiarism and copyright. Your Facebook post is extremely strong and I 100% support you making it. I think your decision to hide behind blushing and paint us as the instigator is absolutely how it should be. Let us take the heat. All you have to say is, my publisher chose to take action. It was and continues to be out of my hands. 
Let people get mad at us. Hi, Anne. Okay, here are my thoughts. It's important to take a stand. After all, Blushing Books wouldn't just be doing this for me. You're doing it for Blushing's best interests, too. Zoe Ellis is stealing from both of us. I would not write the author a warning letter. She is aware of what she did and has already stirred up shit and lied by omission. File the DMCAs immediately to Amazon, iTunes, and Barnes & Noble. Should only take five minutes each. If you want to write her afterward with demands to see her financials, by all means, go for it. If Amazon, iTunes, and Barnes & Noble comply with the DMCA, which they should, considering the evidence, and a stinker rises, I am prepared for the backlash. I went through it with Reborn, and I'm not afraid. To settle it down, I will deflect to blushing and remain distant and naive. Readers sent in complaints. The publisher filed a DMCA based on evidence they uncovered of copyright infringement. Any issues should be raised with them. This is out of my hands, and I will remain silent publicly, unless it gets to a point that a single professional post on the topic, once again deflecting to the publisher, needs to be posted. Some people will be reactive right out of the gate, but that's why I have a publisher to hide behind. It will pass quickly. So long as I stay above the fray, we're all good. I'm very good at not engaging with crazy. <laughs> <Whew>. um, <laughs> so, uh, if it's not obvious, this is um, perjury. She was the one who demanded the DMCA takedowns and her publisher colluded with her to make it seem like she was this innocent dumbass who had no idea how the system works. My publisher did everything. I, I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> I agree with the others you've spoken to. I don't think you will suffer any negative consequences by moving forward. Amazon might not take the other author's book down, but I don't see you or Blushing being penalized in any way. There's no way she could file anything against your book since yours came out two years earlier. <sighs> Woof. I mean, how? But here is a particularly prescient observation sent by Blushing Books to Kane right before they start raining DMCA fire down. However, before we move ahead, I'd like you to really think about whether you'd want to do this. I agree, it's sickening. She clearly plagiarized your entire plot. But that having been said, is this really hurting you? If anything, fans of her books, reading the reviews of her books, might buy yours. Controversy frequently helps books. I don't think there's a point at which anyone would ever be on Amazon and be trying to decide between her book and yours and choose hers. They might read both, but one or the other? Probably not. If we move ahead with this, you'll have a profound enemy for life. Someone who will likely attack you at every opportunity and get all of her friends to do so. She'll come up with another pen name and be your worst nightmare. I'm not trying to tell you to not do it, but I do want you to go in with the clear-eyed understanding that, as hard as it might be to swallow, doing nothing is an option that should be on the table. However, if you want to go ahead with it, blushing supports you 100%. Now that I've thought it over, both books should be taken down. She shouldn't profit off screwing me over. What can I say but yikes? <laughs> And it did not end here. They went back and forth for months trying to keep Ellis's books from making any money, even after Ellis had successfully fought the claims that originally took her books down. Her books are back up on iBooks. They are also on Kobo and Google Play, and I'm super mad, not at you, at this fucked up situation. Can we please send out DMCA takedown notices to these people? Also, what are we going to do about Amazon? Help! She's lost her Apple account, though her other titles are still on Barnes & Nobles and Kobo. I don't know what mechanism we can use to shut her down completely as an author, unless you want to try to trademark Omegaverse, which we might be able to get. I think our best strategy right now is to push Amazon hard. If she loses her account completely, it will in effect shut her down. If you have a different, better plan or strategy, please share it. Book 3 needs to come down too. I don't want her to make any more money off this series. So, um, this is what the kids call a bad look. So, the plaintiffs file a motion that Kane perjured herself. She should be adjudged guilty of civil contempt. And three days later, the defendants offer a complete settlement, admit that Ellis did not infringe on anyone's copyright, they revoke the DMCA takedowns, and the case is closed. In Oklahoma, anyway. Justice is served? Well, hold on there, Pard. This is just the Oklahoma case. Remember, there is still a case going on in Virginia. So the Virginia case keeps going, and here is where it gets even weirder. 
So the Virginia case is specifically against Kane, not the publisher, because Kane is based in Virginia. And while Ellis's claim did involve all the original stuff about like, you know, wrongful DMCA takedowns, it also has all of this other stuff that is just like way harder to prove in a court of law, and they probably overshot their load with too many claims. So most of it gets thrown out. But you know, whatever, they've got her where they want her. If the judge or a jury finds Miss Kane in the wrong, the case would send a message to overzealous genre writers that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is not to be abused. But then it just kind of fizzles out. Usually in cases like this, it's the defendant that becomes insolvent, but here, Quillink dissolved and had to drop the case because apparently they just ran out of money. And when Quillink lost their counsel, they couldn't hire a new counsel because there's this like obscure UK law that says you can't do that. So in order to continue the case, they'd basically have to create a new legal entity in the US and start over. And on top of all that, the only part of that case that's still ongoing is Kane's countersuit in Virginia. And because this is endless petty fandom bullshit, the counterclaim is for like defamation of character and emotional damages and more of that shit, accusing also Zoe Ellis of using sock puppets to like, you know, leave bad reviews. And what's going on right now is Ellis just seems to have disappeared and is just kind of ignoring Kane's counterclaim which is shitty and kind of suspicious in and of itself, but like at this point we're way out of the weeds of like DMCA abuse and into just petty fandom drama. So uh, I guess we've come full circle. So, one of the uh, benefits of it taking us roughly like four years on average to edit one of these episodes is that while we were editing it, uh, the case finally got resolved. And you'll never guess how it ended. Was there some consequence to Addison Kane and her oops all perjury? <laughs> The U.S. Federal Court in the Eastern District of Virginia has dismissed all of the claims against me with prejudice. This is an important victory, not just for myself and my family, but for all authors who have ever or may ever find themselves in a situation where they must defend their copyright. Of course not. The entire case was dismissed with prejudice, and Kane really wants you to know that in a post she titled, A Win for the Author Community. So the lesson learned here seems to be doubling down. I didn't do anything wrong. The DMCA takedowns were valid and I'm the real victim here. For those new to legal jargon, it is a serious matter for a judge to dismiss counts of a lawsuit with prejudice. And it is only done in the most egregious of circumstances. So I spent like my entire Saturday digging through every single court document in this stupid case. And I couldn't find any that were actually submitted by the court that used with prejudice in their verbiage anywhere, except for the defendant's motion to dismiss the case, where they request that the court dismiss it with prejudice. And the motion was granted, but the word prejudice with or without doesn't come up at all. And, and that's because with prejudice is kind of implied when a case is dismissed for failure to prosecute, as was the case here. They fizzled out and missed a bunch of deadlines and they pissed the judge off and the judge was like, okay, screw it, you clearly aren't taking this seriously. That is why <laughs> the case was dismissed, not because the DMCA takedowns are valid. And she's definitely wrong about with prejudice only being done in the most egregious of circumstances. Because with prejudice is pretty much the default. If your claims get dismissed, it's usually with prejudice. And in this case, the judge probably doesn't bother even stating with prejudice in the court documents because it's not the all caps big deal she seems to think it is. See how they squirm and they see how I do Dismiss with prejudice. If anything, it's more unusual for cases to be dismissed without prejudice. I mean, it's not uncommon, but with prejudice is more common. Basically, the case was dismissed because it was clear that the plaintiff could not move forward. 
not because the case itself was without merit. And don't get me wrong, some of it was, but the stuff surrounding copyright and DMCA, especially since Kane perjured herself in the Oklahoma case, they had a pretty good case there. And Kane is right about some things, namely how suspicious and weird it is that Zoe Ellis created the case in Virginia and then just kind of fizzled it out and liquidated her own company, meaning Kane can't pursue her counterclaim. Like, yeah, that is a little sus. But again, that has nothing to do with the validity of the DMCA takedowns or any damages Ellis might have incurred because of them. She goes on to state that the settlement between Blushing and Quilt Ink that happened in the Oklahoma case after she was dismissed from it is legally meaningless. Instead, Blushing made a single statement to avoid further litigation, claiming no plagiarism had occurred and that their DMCAs were invalid. That statement legally means nothing. Wait, wait, no, uh, yes, actually, it, it means a lot. It means they broke the law and are admitting that they broke the law. The funny thing here is that she undermines her own point. Like, plagiarism is not a legal term, therefore plagiarism is not technically illegal in the way that, like, stabbing is not a legal term, therefore stabbing is not technically illegal, but assault with a deadly weapon is. <laughs> Ipso facto. If there was no plagiarism, then there was no copyright infringement, the thing that is illegal. <laughs> by definition, a settlement means an agreement to resolve the legal dispute by both parties prior to trial. No judge ruled on the case. And by definition, like she keeps saying this to by definition, like you sound like Ben Shapiro. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass pure. Well, by definition, copyright is the right to make copies, okay? Now that is a fact. It is right there in the word. Copyright is the right to make copies. It is easier to prove than plagiarism. But if there was no plagiarism, it's right there in the word, then there was no copyright infringement because copies were not made. <laughs> is Ben Shapiro gonna sue me now? But she is wrong in that the settlement in the Oklahoma case is legally meaningless. Most settlements are confidential, so we never know what the terms are. So blushing admitting in a court document that the DMCAs were invalid actually does give it some precedential effect over any future cases that might argue over these same details. So if only in a minor way, maybe blushing admitting that they were in the wrong to the court is actually kind of a good thing. Not a big win, but one minor precedent to defend against DMCA abuse Go team. But the most batshit, unhinged from reality claim that she makes in this whole thing is in response to the question of why did you send DMCA takedowns for the third Myth of Omega book, which at that time had not even come out yet and therefore you could not have read. Because both my Alpha's Claim trilogy and Zoe Ellis's trilogy were meant to be read as a whole, books one and two ending in a cliffhanger. Therefore, I believed that the unpublished book was a derivative work. I own trilogies now? She then goes on to cast every other person involved but herself as the villain. She's super mad about that New York Times article. And they were way nicer to her than I was, and certainly nicer than uh, the A-Lab podcast, uh, which I definitely listened to and found very helpful in establishing the timeline for this wacky, crazy shenanigans. I'm not going to repeat some of the things they said, but uh, the New York Times was way nicer than they were and certainly nicer than I was. Interestingly, the same month the article ran, the NYT parted ways with at least one editor who admitted an article was rushed into publication, that the editing process was flawed, and, shockingly, then admitted to not even reading the op-ed before it ran online. So she connects the integrity of the editor of Alexandra Alter, who wrote the original New York Times article, to the op-ed editor who resigned after asking Tom Cotton to write a pro-police brutality op-ed. Like these two are even in the same department, implying that these two editors who happen to work for the same paper at the same time are the same person. Like, this is the level of intellectual honesty we are dealing with here. In fact, Zoe Ellis sat down with a journalist for the NYT who rushed the story, failed to cite sources, failed to remain unbiased, and misquoted both myself and the facts. Oh my god. 
The article is the citation. Like, this isn't a blog. This isn't like a peer-reviewed journal entry, Addison. <laughs> Newspaper articles don't have footnotes. <laughs> Blushing Books, who totally threw themselves in front of the bus for Addison a year earlier, is also the bad guy now. During this experience, I learned that my former publisher, Blushing Books, had never filed copyrights for any of my books, despite what I believe was a contractual responsibility to do so. What? What do you mean you believe? Like, read your freaking contract. You can check if they violated their contractual obligation, you can sue them. And if they didn't ever say they were going to file your copyright for you, then you didn't read your contract. But that doesn't mean that Blushing is necessarily innocent here either. The blog post reveals that Kane and Blushing had a big falling out during the Oklahoma case in which she got the rights to distribute her book back. And she very pettily shows an email between Blushing and another author showing that Blushing basically had no clue what they were doing and understood nothing about copyright law and what actually constitutes copyright infringement. How many assholes we got on this ship anyhow? Yo! Kane then goes after the Romance Writers of America and is very upset about the RWA protecting blushing. Like, what are you talking about? Blushing has been on notice as a like bad publisher by the RWA since 2019. And here she is trying and failing to start shit with another much more famous romance novelist who had earlier opined on the case and incidentally is a lawyer herself. Everyone is enemy mine and I am the wronged one. <laughs> like maybe you're the problem, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Oof, internet was a mistake. So she's trying really hard to frame this as an I was right all along and this is a win for authors and I'm helping you actually. When in reality, after the details of her involvement and malice and subsequent perjury were revealed to the court in the Oklahoma case, her publisher settled because their author perjured herself and Kane got to walk away with effectively no consequences from that while the other lawsuit against her in another state fizzled and died for completely unrelated reasons. And that is how it ends. That was pointless. I don't know if you could see what I was doing there. It was like a visual joke. We got alpha, beta, omega. <laughs> you think a depressed person could make this? No. So if you were reading this as an invitation to go harass this woman, first of all, what the hell is wrong with you? And also, why are you even watching my channel? Second, don't. But this is less a cautionary tale of one vindictive author. The New York Times article claims that it raises a deep legal question, but it isn't really a deep legal question about who owns ideas. If there is a deep legal question, it is how can people without the resources of giants like YouTube protect themselves from bad faith DMCA claims. DMCA counterclaims do exist as a barrier and Zoe Ellis did use them, but clearly that wasn't enough because Kane and Blushing steamrolled right through them and kept issuing takedowns for months. So a lot of the focus on this case was on the weird fanfic subculture and not the fact that cases like this can and often do set important legal precedents. To me, this is less about a too horny on main train wreck as much as it is a good example of how laws designed to protect giant corporations are written in presumed good faith and assume that everyone is going to play by the rules. I tried to protect authors. Well, as a fellow USA Today best-selling author who writes extremely niche trash involving questionable use of non-human anatomies, um, I cannot say I feel protected by this. If she had won this thing, which she didn't, <laughs> that would have meant, despite her claims to the contrary, that you can actually own genre tropes, which would make creating that much more difficult and give bad faith actors that much more arsenal to attack their fellow artists. And in cases like these, we do kind of need to say something when bad faith actors try to use this sort of thing to their advantage and might inadvertently strengthen already draconian copyright law pushed by the likes of the Walt Disney Company and all for your petty vindictive bullshit. 
So uh, this this attitude is bad. <laughs> Don't do it. You can't own tropes. I've learned you can do anything you want as long as you put your mind to it. But I've also learned that reading is bad. So we did have a lot of help writing this. Um, I learned a lot about reading court documents and uh, me and Angelina had to read a lot of torture porn. <laughs> I mean that in the most literal sense. Porn with torture. Literal torture porn. It's like snuff for her. Thanks especially to Stacy Lantain of the University of Mississippi School of Law and Catherine Trindacosta with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The EFF is the leading nonprofit defending digital privacy and free speech, and a portion of the profits of this video are going to be donated to the EFF. Take care, you beautiful people, and remember to wear a mask in public. And if this video mysteriously disappears for, I don't know, some reason, I guess we'll see you in court.